This is an excerpt from the audiobook of From Coping to Thriving, How to Turn Self-Care into a Way of Life by Hannah Brain from becomingwhoyouare.net. Two, obstacles to self-care. There is no need to go to India or anywhere else to find peace. You will find that deep place of silence right in your room, your garden, or even your bathtub. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Many people have a common misconception that self-care is something you do when you have a certain lifestyle, with a certain amount of income and a certain amount of time to spare. The fact is, that's just not true. Self-care is health care. Just as we might go to see doctors and dentists, we need to take care of our existential needs, too. We are in the best position to be the best version of ourselves, fulfill our dreams, live our potential, have our best relationships, do our best work, and most importantly, enjoy life when we've taken care of our needs. In fact, we are only able to be the best version of ourselves, fulfill our dreams, live our potential, have our best relationships, and do our best work when we have taken care of our needs. This reality runs counter to the popular view that it's selfish to put ourselves first. Many of us struggle with feeling like we haven't yet achieved enough, been enough, earned enough, or sacrificed enough to be worthy of self-care. This was the place I started from when I began taking my self-care seriously. It took a long time to understand that this was a chicken-egg situation. I was reluctant to engage in self-care and take time to focus on meeting my needs in a healthy and sustainable way until I felt worthy of doing so. But I didn't necessarily feel like I was worthy of doing so until I started engaging in self-care and meeting my needs in a healthy and sustainable way. This Catch-22 situation is partly due to our cultural fanaticism about altruism, putting others first, and the virtue of hard work. Many of us are raised to believe that we only deserve a day off if we've been working ourselves to the bone. Once this belief becomes embedded in our self-concept, it's hard to shift. I used to view one day off in four months as an achievement, not as a sign that something was severely wrong with the fun quotient in my life. I rarely stopped working when I got sick, and I took pride in pushing myself as far as I could go. I felt effective, efficient, and terribly unhappy. I found that I need to be constantly vigilant of how I approach the balance between work and leisure activities in my life. Otherwise, this balance will inevitably tip in favor of the work side. With the gift of hindsight, I can look back and see that my desire to be constantly working and constantly busy came from a need to feel worthy. In addition, I had a sense that if I just live my life as myself, not Hannah who does all these things and does them well, then I wouldn't be enough. We all have many needs that fit under the overarching category of worthiness. The constant struggle to meet those needs is one I've seen many times over in people who aren't happy with the way their life is playing out, yet aren't aware that it is internal shifts, not external changes, that will lead to the change they're seeking. As I'll talk about in the next chapter, being busy is a great coping strategy and one of the biggest emotional barriers to self-care. For now, I want to move the focus to two of the biggest practical and, secondarily, emotional barriers to self-care, money and time. Money. Most of us have a complicated relationship with money. Money has come to represent so much in our culture that many of us equate our financial worth with our personal worth. When this happens, we feel worth more as a person when we have or are earning more money, and worth less as a person when we have or are earning less money. These feelings of having more or less value greatly impact our behavior and our feelings around whether we are worthy of self-care. When we equate our financial worth with our self-worth, we might give ourselves permission to engage in self-care only when things are, quote, going well financially. Equally, financial challenges can leave us feeling stressed, isolated, and lacking in some way. Of course, there are many reasons why we might struggle to accept our current finances. Maybe we're under-earning. Perhaps we're unconscious about where our money goes every month. Maybe we're shouldering a lot of debt. Perhaps we have an addictive or compulsive behavior that has a negative impact on our finances. 
Or maybe we've recently gone through a life transition, such as divorce, redundancy, or death, that has changed our financial situation. These things aren't necessarily a reflection of us as people. However, they can feel that way. We encounter practical situations, or we develop certain behavioral and spending patterns that not only shake our sense of security and stability, but also our sense of worthiness. The link between financial worth and self-worth won't be true for absolutely everyone. However, money and finances are complex topics, and many of us aren't even aware of how much emotional investment we have in them. This connection is not only something I've struggled with myself, but also an issue I've come across repeatedly when listening to other people's experiences. It feels important to highlight the connection between the two types of worth here, as well as the possible connection between our financial situation and our level of self-care. After all, the more aware we are of these connections, the less unconscious power they have over us. Time I don't have time to dedicate to self-care is another reason people feel excluded from the club. I want to start with a home truth. Emotion and tone can be difficult to convey through writing, so please know that I offer the following words with compassion, not judgment. It's not a question of enough time. It's a question of priorities. No doubt, your day is filled with errands, tasks, and activities that feel important. I want you to ask yourself, what makes them more important than self-care? Now, have a think about the following. How would your ability to handle the load on your plate improve if you were operating at your most efficient, switched on, motivated, and energized? When we're cash poor, time poor, or a combination of both, we might not feel like we have the time or resources to engage in self-care. However, I have a different perspective. Far from being a time when we don't deserve self-care, this is the time when we most need self-care. The times when we feel like we least deserve self-care are the times when it will be most useful to us. Therefore, the times we think we least deserve self-care are the times when it will be most helpful to show ourselves care. Although they're hard to avoid sometimes, I hesitate to use the words need, should, or must in relation to self-care. Often these words carry a sense of obligation and feed our inner shame gremlins, to borrow a term from researcher and writer Dr. Brene Brown. I'm very aware of the fine line between making suggestions and saying that you as the reader should be doing or need to do XYZ for this reason. This distinction is important, so it's something I discuss in more detail in a later chapter, Self-Care and Shame. The Truth About Self-Care and How to Do It our society perpetuates the pervasive and influential story that self-care revolves around external activities and actions, going to a spa, buying a new mud mask, etc. According to popular belief, the equation goes, self-care equals external factors influencing our internal feelings. This is a myth. 80 to 90 percent of self-care is an inside job. This means that most of our self-care revolves around our internal processes. It's about how we interact with ourselves, how we deal with our internal conflicts, how we process information from external circumstances, and how our history affects the way we go about this. When we try to do self-care by flitting from external activity to external activity, we're neglecting to pay attention to our unmet underlying needs. Most importantly, we're neglecting to set an intention for what we want to get out of our self-care. Self-care is about knowing which needs we want to fulfill, knowing how we want to feel, and seeking out nourishing and nurturing activities that will meet those needs and generate those feelings. As much as we might hear about the vegan meditation yoga countryside retreats, and as great as that might sound, it's not the vegan meditation yoga countryside retreat that we specifically need right now. What we're yearning for when we desire something like that are the feelings it creates in us. With this in mind, it's important to distinguish between self-care and self-indulgence or pampering. Self-care is about starting with an unmet need or desired feeling. Self-indulgence is about feeling good right here, right now, regardless of whether we're meeting our underlying long-term needs. 
Many activities that conventionally file under the label self-care, spa days, massages, except to relieve aches, pains, and tensions, manicures, makeovers, and so on, are actually self-indulgence. There's nothing wrong with self-indulgence. Who doesn't like to feel good? But these activities alone are not necessarily going to help us meet our unmet needs. In this way, self-indulgence can become similar to coping strategies, more on these in the next chapter, and often involves meeting one or more of our needs at the expense of one or more of our other needs. True self-care is about identifying and taking steps to meet our needs without compromising other needs. Now that we've noted the difference between self-care and self-indulgence, we can bust the no-time-and-no-money myths for good. Self-care is about your relationship with yourself. Consequently, the amount of money in your bank account or the amount of time in your weekly schedule has nothing to do with your levels of self-care. As you'll see from the list of suggestions coming up, you can choose from a variety of self-care activities that don't require massive amounts of time or money. Whatever you choose to include in your self-care practice, the effects of your self-care will be hit or miss if you don't ask two questions. For self-care with maximum effectiveness that impacts you right where you need it to, consider this. What do I want to get out of my self-care? In other words, what is my intention? How do I want to feel having engaged in this self-care practice? Simple questions, but taking the time to consider them will boost your self-care to a whole new level. Before we continue, we're going to talk about the crucial difference between coping strategies and self-care in the next chapter. But before we move on, I want to mention another common self-care mistake that has tripped me up in the past and requires vigilance. As I mentioned, self-indulgence doesn't always fill the function of self-care, because when we indulge, we risk meeting one or more of our needs at the expense of one or more of our other needs. When we engage in an act of self-care, it's important to make sure we're not doing this. Otherwise, it's not really self-care at all. For example, if we have the need for sleep and the need for connection, staying up until 2 a.m. talking with friends will meet the need for connection, but that's going to be at the expense of our need for sleep. In the context of self-care, this is especially important when it comes to the two hot topics above, money and time. We're so used to thinking about self-care as something that requires a lot of time and money that we don't recognize that self-care is a totally separate entity. Money in particular can provoke all kinds of complicated emotional and physical feelings. At two extreme ends of the scale, a proportion of people believe it is wrong to spend money on themselves, while at the other end, a proportion of people believe that spending money on themselves will make them feel better. Equally, if you're feeling pushed and pulled in many directions time-wise, you want whatever self-care activities you engage in to be respectful and allowing of that, not to deepen your stress. When we try to create a self-care practice containing activities that conflict with certain needs, those needs will strike back. If we're meeting some needs at the expense of others, those unmet needs will find a way to get themselves heard. More often than not, this will cost you your self-care practice. Your unmet needs will show up as internal conflict, resistance, self-criticism, and a range of other possible, equally unpleasant manifestations. Even if you manage to maintain your self-care practice, it's not self-care if it's provoking self-attack. Being aware of and negotiating between these conflicting needs can be challenging and often comes down to a trial and error process. I've attempted to include a range of suggestions in this book that you can tailor in such a way as to meet your unmet needs without sacrificing other needs at the same time. When it comes to choosing your self-care practices, think first about whether a particular practice will cause a conflict in needs, and if so, how can you negotiate that with yourself or adapt to the suggestion so it better meets your needs as a whole? If you enjoyed listening to this excerpt from From Coping to Thriving, How to Turn Self-Care into a Way of Life, you may want to listen to the rest of the audiobook. You can find it on Amazon, iTunes, and Audible. You might also like the author's website, becomingwhoyouare.net, where you can find more content related to what you've just heard from the author, Hannah Brain.